about living presents some obstacles, and one that I found particularly troublesome is the fact that living cannot be talked about directly, but only by means of its outcomes. And arguably the primal outcome of living are dirt and waste. The first thing we do as we're born is screaming, poorly, and get convicted of our unbelievable cord. So my presentation this evening will weave together a number of thoughts, um, starting off with a question on how we may talk of dirt and waste, especially in digital terms. And the words that will follow are informed very much by a conversation I had with a very close friend of mine, um, curator of the Serpent and Gallery of World Chip in Riosi some time ago. But first I'd like to read a quote from Death of a Discipline, which is a really great book by Beatrice Spiva that she wrote in 2003. Um, in this book um, she says, um, I propose the planet to override the globe. Globalization is the imposition of the same system of exchange everywhere. In the great work of electronic capital, we achieve the abstract ball covered in latitude and longitude, cut by virtual lines, once the equator and the tropics and so on, now drawn by the requirement of geographical information systems. To talk planet talk by way of an unexamined environmentalism, referring to an undivided natural space rather than a differentiated political space, can work in the interest of this globalization in the mode of the abstract as such. The globe is on our computers, and no one lives there. So within this context of the globe versus the planet, I'd like us to think about a possible parallel between the idea of dirt, waste, junk that call the material nature, dirt that holds physicality and the semantic connotation of what dirt may signify or be signified by. And as I said earlier, dirt and waste are inevitable outcomes of the act of living. They are discarded materials produced and rejected by us living. Um, often and perhaps by necessity, these materials are also low quality. So generally speaking, waste is dirty, and even if it is clean waste, that means non-toxic, it is still dirty. So I'm thinking about waste with visually and how waste occupies a physical world. Stains and waste in this sense are not so dissimilar, and they both emerge through separation, use, and they also indicate this, a ceased presence. Um, take a hotel room, for example. Um, a hotel room is pleasant to us when clean and clinical, because that appearance makes it belong to no one. We claim it as ours by using it, by staining it, by emptying the minibar and cleaning up the rubbish bin. So I'm interested in the gestural expressiveness of dirt, of the stain, and their relationship to use. What happens when the inclusion of dirt in the work of art is based on visual waste and information jam? Meaning, can we talk about a type of waste which is not physical but intellectual? Is there a type of dirt which is made of discarded contents of a digital nature? How is this affecting creative practices? The metaphor I'd like to draw is with a work by Francis Alice, who's a Mexican artist, and the work is titled The Collector from the early 90s. In this work, the artist walked around Mexico City pulling a little magnetized toy dog behind him through the streets, and the toy dog was collecting all the dirt that was on the path. And I'm thinking about this and thinking whether this action could be translated into the act of navigating through the digital environment and potentially the form of dirt that one would collect would then perhaps be made of information noise or redundancy and things that other people uploaded and discarded or that one probably has no actual interest in or necessity for but they still stick to your brain in the same way the street dirt attaches to Francis Ali's toy dog. So I guess I'm arguing that the waste that we produce through our digital lives becomes a form of pollution which exists on an intellectual dimension, in an intellectual environment, and it sticks to our brain as a gum sticks to the sole of our shoe. As we were exchanging these thoughts, Lucia's phone rang, and she took out this phone, which was not a smartphone that broke, so she had a Nokia break from, you know, the early 2000. And she said that was postmodern vintage, and that made me feel really old. <laughs> We had done a studio visit with an artist for Richard Science, and he wanted to show her a project that he had done for Orbit.com, uh, which is a platform for online projects that ran between 2009 and 2015. But what's interesting about this is that Rachel was saying that he made the work um, previous to the latest uh, version of Google Chrome, so when he tried to show the work, that wouldn't function because Google Chrome had then introduced a number of new um, anti pop up plugins. So what it means, it means that basically his 
work kind of function anymore in the way it used to because it might not just work at all in the future considering the fact that everything is, you know, keeps updating. So the evolution of technology is bringing his work to disappear or maybe without the technology that supports the work, the work is basically just self-destroying itself. So um, from there then I started to think about Baudrillard and the fact that he said that the evolution of technology and that eventually technological progress will just move towards our annihilation. And a striving desire for the thinner, the lighter, the smaller will eventually lead us to the point of total dissolution. Um, can we talk about the gradual disappearance of Richard's work as a Misha, or are we rather witnessing somehow a Darwinian form of evolution from technological survival? Um, what I realise is that the more we create inform information on the internet, the more we feed a continuous expansion of data that occupies the physical space too. Um, data servers, um, data centres, servers, and they all have a physical manifestation somewhere. And the fact that the volume of information is expanding means that also the physical space that information occupies is growing. So actually the proportion between waste versus non-waste or junk versus non-junk is moving towards a situation where we physically live in a pile of junk. When you search something on Google, the ranking implies that the top results are the most relevant or the most recent. However, the pages themselves very often will not tell you the date, the time then, or when they were last updated. It means that you're never clear as to when things are from, or are they updated but old, or are they to be discarded, or is the information still valid? So the critical process of discarding to put things into junk cannot be applied because it requires a mark of time which on the web is often missing. So this way you no longer understand what is superfluous or useless. So for me, the trouble with trying to define intellectual waste of a digital nature is that I can no longer understand easily what is or is not necessary to keep, which things are not useful, what is superfluous, what should be deleted or will be deleted. And the problem with waste, which is formed by digital content, is that even if it's a lot and redundant, it feels, it, it feels as if it didn't take up any space. Um, and what I was saying before, this relationship between the information and its you know, the places where it's physically hold. It's quite abstract because it never takes up physical space for you personally. So you never feel the need to clean up like you would do with your baby's nuggets or with things that you don't need anymore. Um, you keep everything. Technically, potentially, you can keep everything with the digital. So we may be coming into a situation where we're stuck. Um, Borges says that having more books that you can possibly read is a step towards infinity. But perhaps I was thinking there will be a moment in which the number of my unread emails will be such that the amount of time I have left to live will not be enough to read those emails. So there you have only the junk left and spam email responding to you. Um, when your life situations change, you notice how your spam changes too. For example, Lucia was saying that she started getting spam in Germany because she had been living in Germany for some months. And I got spam about drugs because I once bought the pill online. So that's a true response from the junk, as if the waste was listening to us. We live in an era of anxiety in relation to cleaning, detoxing, and it has become healthy to be healthy. So the parameters of how we measure our own well-being are particularly interesting to address in the context, context of living, I think. Um, no one will ever answer my, how are you, by saying that feeling 100%, but that's fine. I think that's a cultural position of modesty and self-deprecation that I think is very common in the UK. But what does it actually mean to feel good or feel okay? Do I ever feel 100%? I think I do sometimes. However, the market forces driving the health industries are setting increasingly higher parameters of well-being, so that we will never ever feel like we have reached that 100% feel good moment. Feeling good and being well are becoming conditions that we can never fully claim or own, even when we are well. So they are aspirational goals set to make us purchase more vitamins and gym classes. It's like the utopian the eye of the iPhone, iPad, eye technologies, that subjectivity does not actually exist. You don't have it. It reflects the creation of an imaginary character, almost like in literary fiction. An imaginary entity which is not us, and that is the I, almost like a superhero. There are many fears, phobias of the present, which remind of the same fears experienced during Cold War. That is contamination, 
painless annihilation of the bomb as the threatening phenomenon of total end. And these fears, I think, reemerge in a different way today. And the voices of the psychoanalysis are no longer inside, but outside of my head. The laptop, the computer, the iPhone, the iPad, and so on, they all allow us to message each other, talk to each other, send things to each other, even just think of the cloud. These are the new voices that we now hear in a revised psychoanalytical sense. So I like to think that in an artistic practice, the traits, features, and subjects that start to emerge appear because of the fact that new things and new elements are introduced into our daily lives. Something which first enters a common imaginary and then, with a second degree of creativity or even without the agent's consciousness, it brings us to the formation of new creative vocabulary. The internet is so vast that if you imagine to evaluate the scale between the amount of content and the audience of the, in of the internet, you will probably get a one-to-one -one scale relationship, or even less. There is more than what can actually be consumed. And so how do you trash? How do you make trash into non-trash? And how do you make non-trash into trash? How do you clean the digital dirt? Internet maintains a relationship with real life in the sense that if there were not elements outside of the web that determine some hierarchies in the content, then the total democracy of things will bring that would bring us to the state of everything being trash. So returning to Francis Salis, the collector, the walk of the artist through the city randomly collects waste of the street. But what would happen if that was a walk performed through the web? What would remain stuck to the brain without us even knowing it as we move step by step, click by click, from one link to the next? How can, how can we watch this jump off? I'm going to conclude with a few quotes from Mirle Ladevan Kelle, Manifesto for Maintenance Art from 1969. A. The death instinct and the life instinct. The death instinct, separation, individuality, avant garde par excellence, to follow one's own path to death, do your own thing, dynamic change. The life instinct, unification, the eternal return the perpetuation and maintenance of the species, survival systems and operations, equilibrium. B, two basic systems, development and maintenance, the sour ball of every revolution. After the revolution, who's going to pick up the garbage on Monday morning? Development, pure individual creation, the new, change, progress, advance, excitement, flight or flee. Maintenance, Keep the dust of the pure individual creation, preserve the new, sustain the change, protect progress, defend and prolong the advance, renew the excitement, repeat the flight.